tell me a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I think that foundationally, my thing is trying to understand and predict motion of stuff in space. The how, the why things move, the way they do in space is my education and foundation. And then there's like, how's that applied in ways that might be beneficial to humanity or whatever. And I started working for NASA on Mars missions. And I, the way that I tell people about this is many people are familiar with these movies where it's like the submarine, like Crimson Tide and that sort of stuff where there's somebody with this headset and they're at a, a sonar station. And basically th their job is to interpret acoustic signals. And that interpretation of the acoustic signals allows that person, him or her, kind of within their mind's eye to kind of visualize the underwater seascape. Mountains and hills over here, another Akula class sub over there, so on and so forth. And my job is very similar in that I have to interpret photons, either light being reflected from objects or radio signals being transmitted to the earth from these objects. And when I interpret that, the structure in the light and in, in the photons where they radio frequency or visible light, the structure, the patterns in that give me insight into where's the earth, where's the moon, where's the sun, what's the shape of this thing, how's it oriented, like all that stuff. That's what I, within my mind's eye, I reconstruct photons and that's what I see. And I do that because, yeah, I, it's my job to try to understand where this thing was and predict where the thing's gonna go. So how did you get involved in space in the first place? After high school, I enlisted in the Air Force and my job was a security guard guarding nuclear missiles in Montana. And, uh, and yeah, during my night shifts, because I grew up in Caracas, well, uh, on a good night, you might see the moon and a couple of stars, and that's about it, because there's so many city lights and that sort of stuff. And so when I went to Montana, it was the first time in my life that I was exposed to a really dark sky, and it changed my life in that I realized, with my own eyes, I realized that space is not empty. I'm like, wow, there's like stars, here's the Milky Way, there's planets Stuff peppered like everywhere. It was like, I felt not alone. and. Interestingly enough, I'd see dots of light go across the sky from time to time that weren't meteors or planes. And when I investigated my curiosity, I found that there are human-made objects orbiting the Earth. And that made me curious to understand that more. So when you were a kid, you, were you a sci-fi nerd? Or? Look, I remember watching Battlestar Galactica, Space 1999, these sorts of things when I was a kid. Yeah, I mean, I'm 51 years old. I may not like, but yeah, I'm getting up there. And yeah, I remember seeing like the original Star Wars in theaters and stuff like that. So I love those sorts of things for sure. But do you think you'll get into space yourself? I don't know, but I don't really want to. I think that's for other people and I applaud them for doing that. To me, there's just a lot of risk in it because as opposed to getting on a plane and kind of worry about cabin depressurization and stuff like that, even going above the Carmen line, you're now exposed to pieces of debris that we can't track that just might whack the hell out of your space capsule and then that's it's all over. So that's a risk that people yeah. just don't recognize or, or embrace. I'm just allergic to yeah. that. I'm allergic to getting hit by random pieces of shrapnel. I was amazed how many objects are floating around. How big are those objects going Yeah, on? so the stuff that we're keeping track of, the smallest thing is probably the size of a cell phone. And, and the thing is, it's like some relative speeds between objects that we track can go all the way up to like 15 times the speed of a bullet. So if a, a, a cell phone that's many times larger than a bullet is traveling 15 times the speed of that, that hits anything, it's a bad day. That's gonna hurt, isn't it? Yes. So what, how are we gonna get all that down? There's no, we have to live soiled bath water. That's the reality of it. Yeah. Space will never be the pristine environment that it was prior to 1957 when we launched Sputnik. We'll never return to that. We can remove some of the debris, just like we can clean some of the stuff out of the oceans, but the oceans will never be completely free of microplastics. So it's similar. I know, is, is there much work going on to find things that can go up and gather satellites to burn them up in the Earth's atmosphere? Yeah, and... there's companies out there that AstroScale, ClearSpace, a few others that want to get into the debris cleaning, on-orbit servicing kind of thing. And I think that, that will happen. 
we're not quite ready yet to see that as like a daily thing, but we're certainly headed in that direction. So yeah, there are companies out there that are trying to make that into a business. What's your focus at the moment? What are you working on by now? I think foundationally, I very much believe that all things are interconnected. And because I believe that all things are interconnected and I see the problems that humanity is facing right now, my greatest challenge is how to recruit empathy from people in solving these problems. And so even though we have significant technical challenges and even policy and political challenges, to me, the greatest challenge is the absence of empathy. And so how do I tell a sufficiently compelling story about the space environmental problem that we face with the debris and all that other stuff that in many ways is a hazard to capabilities that we depend upon right now, like internet communications and that sort of stuff, because nothing is guaranteeing protecting these assets that we rely on critically, even monitoring things like the war in Ukraine and that sort of stuff. Space-based assets provide unique data and information. They tell us more about us. Humanity knows more about ourselves from things that came from space than any other me method. And people just don't mm -hmm. recognize that. And so it's the space environment as an ecosystem, it's a finite resource, at least where we launch satellites is a finite resource. And so I'm trying to just raise awareness on that and trying to make this mainstream across humanity versus just talking to space people because the space people already know and understand it, but the rest of humanity isn't aware of that yet. So my focus is really on this idea of environmentalism. And I believe that by and large people very much easily say space, why should I care? That's not here. I'm worried about schools for my kids. I'm worried about clean water. Who cares about space? So it's not my problem. And because they see that space is being independent from their own lives. And because I believe in this interconnectedness, what I want to do through my own work, not just at the university, but with this company I co-founded Privateer, is basically, can I find a way to gather and show humanity the evidence of this interconnectedness so that people are more reluctant to say that's not my problem because I'm going to show them that ultimately it is. That's what where my efforts are placed. Have you noticed any changing kind of recently on the awareness of the general population about space? I think there is momentum, but I think the only way that this becomes mainstream is through the arts. That's the only way that's going to become mainstream. And basically, until celebrities make it a thing, then the rest of humanity won't accept it as a thing. So. Yeah, this is me, me, this is me pushing in TV, film, media, talking to athletes and that sort of stuff, because if I can get somebody like Leonardo DiCaprio or a Brad Pitt or whatever to just even tweet about space stuff, that is what, that's where the sea change is going to come. It's not going to come from scientists and engineers at all. How are you getting on with that project? I mean, th through my work with Privateer, I'm also trying to promote pitch an idea for a TV series that I call Shifted Space. And shifted sp in, in this TV series, Shifted Space, I'm kind of like a Tony Bourdain for space. Like I'm just going around the globe, having some real raw, rough conversations with people about what's going on in space and that sort of stuff. And just, again, get it into people living rooms or wh whatever, or kind of mobile devices or whatever to, to make that more mainstream and really connect to the human aspect of these things. Me going out and speaking to indigenous people and asking them, hey, have you seen the night sky change? The sky is really part of your culture and heritage and you rely on it. Like, what have you noticed? And how do you feel about people changing your night sky and you're, nobody's asking you how you feel about that or even asking you if that's okay with you or whatever. You're like, that, those are the sorts of conversations that space people in general don't have because they don't really necessarily care about that sort of stuff but that is part of the human story and uh, so that's where i want to go with with all that the human race is going to space no doubt in the next 50 100 years well, we're going to end up with quite a lot of people in space but it'll still be a tiny fraction of the number of people that will remain on so we've got to figure out how to live on this planet well yeah we gotta uh, be able to walk and chew gum at the same time we gotta protect the earth and find a way to thrive around another star altogether so people are like okay people go, going to the moon people going to mars this whole thing about settling mars and stuff with humans sure but that 
that can't be the end state. At some point, our sun fizzles out and there's no more sun. And everything in our solar system that we believe has life, mainly Earth, goes the way of the dodo when that happens. So the only way to extend humanity's expiration date with absolute certainty is to find a rock around another sun to thrive on. We have to do that. And we're very far from that because there's nobody knows how to no, nobody knows how to do warp drives. So what well, do you think we're going to uh, there's going to be a kind of a trash environmental crisis a long time prior to us actually solving that and getting off living in a space on a, an extended space station. The trash problem and sustainability problem is going to come back to all before we solve it that. already is. Yeah. Yeah. If you could convey one particular point out to humanity and get it to, to connect with it. What, what would you say? What would that be? Again, I really embrace belief that all things are interconnected. And if people feel that they are independent of stuff, it's because they're either not looking deep enough, they're not looking far enough, or they're not looking long enough. Because if they do that, they will see that eventually, even though the effects of causes could be escaped in one lifetime, eventually it's going to touch their chi children or their children's children and that sort of stuff. Like it's inescapable. That reality of inescapability of causal relationships that are detrimental to us surviving as a species, that is what I wanna show humanity evidence of. And I think that the only way to do that is gonna be through machines. I think machines are gonna be the answer to helping us see how do you mean machines? Yeah. Humans are really good at contextualizing information, much better than computers are, than machines. What humans can't do is comb through multi-dimensional data cubes. We don't do that. We're not hyper-dimensional analysts. Machines are really good at that. So if we can assemble massive quantities of evidence from all sources and data and information, all this other stuff, and feed all this evidence to machines to then comb through that, to find causal relationships through this hyperdimensionality, machines will be able to do that and then provide that back to us so that we can put that into context to facilitate informed decision-making. So yeah, machines are, are our answer to surviving as a species. Okay. And you're talking about the use of and the developments with AI in order to analyze the data and point things and computing capability. Do you think there's a crisis point that you can envisage in the future? That's already happening. But the thing that I want to be very careful of is people keep on saying, what's the point of no return where we're already doomed? I think that it's detrimental to try to even put that line in the sand because what the tendency evokes is that as soon as you that you've crossed the line, you give up. Be and I see that across people. young people like, ah, oh, what's the point? Like, we're already done. It's not going to work. It's like young people very quickly ingest cynicism and pessimism. And then they're like, yeah, there's nothing for me to do. So I'm just going to do whatever I want because it I can't change anything. I can't like, it's already, it's gone. That is detrimental. The truth is that life is resilient, man. Life is resilient. Everything that I've seen with my own eyes in mother nature, I'm constantly surprised at how resilient life is. Life fights, life struggles. And if we can at least have a successful conversation with nature to be an aid in the struggle versus a detriment to it, I believe a lot of the things, and there's evidence of reversibility of detriment. Many climate scientists said, oh, we're, here's the line in the sand, we're done. No, we're not. By modifying our behavior, we actually can make improvements and reverse some of the detriment. Clearly things that have become extinct, you know, extinction by definition is they don't come back, but I don't know, people are discovering things that they thought were extinct that all of a sudden it's like, oh wow, this thing showed up or whatever. Nature finds a way, man. But we need to we need to be collaborative with nature in in, in facilitating that. Yeah, and um, for evolutionary 
purposes and evolutionary time frames. We need to give nature time. Exactly. To that's heal. right. Need... And, and that's yeah. actually a principle of so-called traditional ecological knowledge or indigenous knowledge. Like I believe in TEK big time. I feel that the answer to solving humanity's largest problems are found in indigenous cultures because the only way for many indigenous people every day is an existential crisis if they overfish if they overfarm if they over anything they die they don't make it and so they have been what you're talking about this idea of giving nature time to provide us feedback of the unintentional consequences of our actions. That's exactly what we need to do. Awesome. Really interesting speaking with you. Thank you so much for coming on. Right. I look forward to working with you again sometime in the near future. All right, know how to find me. So yeah, it's been a pleasure. All right, thanks.